Okay, so we've started talking about how to change the world. Now we're really going to get down to business. Um, and I want to start with George, because we've got four different people who are using data in incredibly in very different ways here, um, going from big assembled ways of using data that really take data and analyze them en masse to figuring out how people can use their own data and figure out what it means. And so we're going to start with the really big thing, which is, George, you're doing what I think is one of the coolest sequencing, pairing of sequencing and patient data that I've heard about. Tell us about it. Well, we're working with uh, a number of partners, notably places like Geisinger, which is a integrated healthcare provider payer system, which um, which probably pioneered the entire electronic medical records uh, business uh, more than 20 years ago now. Um, and uh, other partners, such as at Columbia and other places, where we get very information-dense patient volunteers who want to work with us in our studies. So now that sequencing has become really a commodity, and since you can now sequence so many people, uh, the the real question or issue is who you sequence. We heard a great story this morning about if you have a lot of information, you can sequence an individual and you can actually benefit that individual. But what we're talking about is a completely different approach at the beginning where we work with these partners who have a lot of information about patients. We work with the patient volunteers themselves and we work with, people have to understand that the sequence is just a beginning for us, for the process. We work with them all uh, in a way where we try to inform about biology and eventually leading to therapeutics that might help everybody, not just a very rare individual with a rare mutation. So let me give you an example of the sort of things that we're trying to do, which I think illustrates where the power comes from. So like I said, you heard this morning about this great story about you sequence an individual, you find one mutation that they have that's very rare and they can be helped by a really orphan drug. Well, here's a story that starts with a very rare family, uh, a rare family in Utah that unfortunately had a very, very high rate of early cardiovascular death in the family. And then this was realized that this was due to the fact that they had super high levels of cholesterol and so the gene was actually mapped, what gene was actually causing that. That was just the starting point. So this poor family um, had this genetic defect, which was resulting in both very high cholesterol and in very high rates of cardiovascular death. Once you knew that gene, you could now look, if you had access to large populations and large data sets, you could look to see whether this particular gene was also altered in other ways in the very large population. And what in fact this led to the discovery of a reciprocal population, not of susceptible individuals, but essentially of, I don't know how you want to term them, they could be you know, super people or X-Men, which were almost entirely protected. I think we usually call them an aerobics instructor in Texas. <laughs> there, was, there, there was one example of that. But basically the point is these people were entirely protected from cardiovascular disease and from um, uh, high LDL levels. And so once we realized that, we could use, and remember, as I said, this is just a starting point, we could then use all of our other integrated sets of technologies that we had uh, uh, accessible to us to turn that into a, a new drug, which essentially could mimic this rare genetic mutation that created Superman, and now we could actually give it to people. And the and data- And you just presented a whole bunch of data at the American Heart Association in, uh, on November 19th, I think it was. And, and you're right, and the data is, is really emerging that perhaps now using what looks like a potentially safe biologic that you can give to human beings perhaps once a month, you can mimic this X-Man phenotype, and basically protect a very large group of people, regardless of what their genetic background is. They don't have to have any mutations. Um, they could be entirely normal, but you could make them resistant to cardiovascular disease. And I think that that's one of the other big hopes, 
It's not just getting individual patients and individual patients' genomes and trying to figure out how to treat the one patient. It's using the collective information that you could generate by, for example, these sort of large collaborations that we have with the Geisinger, with Columbia, or with other partners that we have to give us these clues about how to come up with the next generation of therapeutics that can really deliver uh, important benefit to very large groups of patients, not only rare patients suffering from mutation. Eric? So is this the right way, I mean, this big, this pairing of electronic medical records and, and sequencing and using that as your way of trying to find, is this the, is this the approach that, uh, I think we all agree that we want to find more of that gene is PCSK9, and we all want more PCSK9s. I think everybody at the, would like more PCSK9s, these perfect drug targets. Is this how you'd find them? Are you and George in agreement on this? Yeah, I think it's definitely one, uh, one of the, a good way uh, to do it, certainly linking up DNA to phenotypic information and doing very broad screens where you're looking for protective effects. I mean, it's PCSK9 is one example. They're CCR5 for the HIV, limiting uh, mm -hmm. HIV uh, uh, AIDS uh, from, from protecting against infection. There's a beta thalassemia with the fetal globin gene uh, making up for loss in, in adult globin. And so many of these sorts of things have been found. And my thought is how to, you know, link that sort of information with information not that's just residing within an, a person's electronic medical record, but what can you collect on individuals, engage them in their own life course journey through their health course to acquire more and more information to link up to that DNA information. So I think the EMR is one starting point, but I think five to 10 years from now, there's gonna be more information on your health, your well-being outside of the medical center than inside of the medical center. So how do you engage consumers uh, to be partners in that uh, effort? Which one of you wants to go first? Well, I was gonna say that's the setup. Right? Uh, um, so, patient. That's a where it's it's because I'm on stage. No, I have your mic. That's what you it have was. my mic. Yeah. Um, so uh, patients like me uh, was started uh, to essentially address the issue that, that Eric brought up, which is how can you take um, high resolution phenotypic data? So essentially, what's the experience of having a disease? The the the, the symptoms. The um, how it affects your life, the way it affects your ability to operate in the world, uh, and, and then bring that as an evidence model into um, you know, the understanding of how effective therapeutics are. Uh, though I think really most importantly, and I, uh, this is sort of a misunderstood or, um, or not really understood thing about the way we think of our company, at some level what we really are is a diagnostic development support platform. Because the, the idea is to determine how you find um, relationships between new molecular markers of disease or health and how that affects the human condition. Um, and, you know, if I could, you know, you asked the question about electronic medical records, and I think this is a really uh, important thing to understand as a gap in our system in the way we're looking at this problem. Uh, right now, uh, most of our use of this sort of uh, genomic discovery approaches that, that you just described are, are coming from extreme phenotypes. And what that means is something that is, is dominant and penetrant and, and, and sort of very obvious and shows up very strongly as a signal. And that's the kind of thing that you can pick up either just in an in electronic medical record, a diagnosis pattern, or, in, or in, in just, you know, obviously. But I think when you move beyond that, and you try and understand um, at a more subtle level, you know, what are genes that affect um, mental health or productivity? What are genes that affect um, how well one manages stress or pain or other variables, which are uh, much more subtle in their expression in the world? We have to address the issue that, that the electronic medical records and the information in them are, are, are just really incredibly sparse and weak in terms of describing the human condition. So we take our mission as, uh, at this point, sort of making the human condition computable. And, and I think this is really important because right now all of this research is still essentially human connected. Like you take a problem or a question, a human being interrogates a database looking for one signal and then matches it, you know, maybe even at scale against the genomic pattern or a biome pattern or some other component. But because the human condition exists in these sort of not well coded, not well understood, uh, not repeatable or matchable across systems definitions, 
you can't really let a computer begin to look at this and start to ask the questions, can we evaluate the patterns? And, and I think that, that in order for us to realize much of what we heard this morning about how we manage um, cancer uh, and, and how we manage all of the other variables, we have to re think very carefully about how we design our information system to understand the human condition such that computers can solve it. And right now, I, I see a real gap that was mentioned here where, where given what we know and how we know it and how it's coded, um, we're going to have a real blockage in the ability to move beyond our current sort of high signals that are driving great advances in advancing drugs to sort of more subtle and meaningful signals that allow us to use this information to tune each of our individual goals and outcomes. Linda, your platform is not so much about, um, about creating data, as I understand it, but more about helping the individual collect it for themselves, right? I mean, how, explain. Well, it's, it's a combination, um, and we haven't launched yet. So right. It's, it's not right. out in the open yet. But um, the, the idea is that in addition to all of the, you know, the Internet of Things and all the wearable devices that we're going to have access to, and they're going to be crazy. There's some really incredible stuff that's going to be coming. Uh, the point is, is where do all those data go? Do they go off to all those separate companies, or could you bring that all together? And definitely, to Jamie's point, is then what are the subtle things that we start to recognize, both on a you know, community level, looking at everyone, versus just yourself, and what can you learn from that? And actually, Peter Thiel had a really good point in his book, Zero to One. Um, they were talking about when PayPal was trying to solve the fraud problems. And they thought they could just do it through machine learning and through the computers. But what they found was the co it was the combination of the computer plus human beings coming back in and looking at what the computer spotted. I think it's going to be the same with our health data, that, that we'll be able to get patterns and interesting signals coming from the computers and the algorithms. But then we have to give that back to the person to say, OK, does this mean something to you? Otherwise, you know, I think that we're going to come up with a lot of false positives and things, and it's just not going to be that meaningful. So uh, here's kind of the question I wanted to get us all thinking about, which is it seems like there are two worlds here, and they could possibly coexist, but they, they kind of line up with the old software worlds of you have the closed Apple model and the open source Linux model. I mean, who, so who, I meant who owns the, the data. Um, I don't think that's the right question. No. You, OK. Well, then, Jamie, ask the right question. <laughs> well, I mean, so this is not a question of open versus closed, so there's a component of that. I, I think that the big shift in, in biology or biodiscovery right now is, is, is equivalent to the shift between sort of mainframe computing and personal computing. And it, it's not that, um, I mean, the, main, you know, the original mainframe the industry was a pretty open space. People were very collaborative, but it was very, there were very few people operating it. And so you had um, you know, immense expenditures with a few leaders working on that. And so the, the sort of cost per idea tested was quite high. And again, I mean, amazing advances like your drug and, and some other drugs you know, that have come out of that kind of process. And I think that what we're really entering now is the sort of personal computer age of biology. You know, and you can see it in that you know, the cost of um, the systems are coming down to the point where they're almost acquirable by individuals. And, you know, it's still $20,000, $40,000 for equipment. But my lab, you know, we used to buy equipment that cost a half, a half a million dollars or more, and you could run a few experiments on it. And those things have come down. It's so, such an incre incredible cost curve. You know, the, the power of what we could do now that what we could do 15 years ago in the lab is just, it's just not even comparable. So to me, the thing to think about here is that it's no longer going to be a few leaders with big tech and big systems that are locked in their box and they're asking their few questions. It's going to be a distributed system of lots of people asking lots of questions with lots of things. And I think the, the interesting question well, there is that what sounds would be the awesome, but I really wonder if it's true. And I was just going to ask George, who's raising his finger. Um, I mean, are we really? Because I'm I'm actually after watching drug development for a while now, I'm not sure that that's true. I'm not sure that, in fact, I think our cost per, not only in terms of drugs, but even when you're talking about diagnostics, just because your, sequen your sequencing costs are going down doesn't mean that E-Room's law stops going up. We don't really seem to understand why biology is so hard. That's what I was going to get at. What we got to understand is, I guess this is a healthcare 
conference, and we are talking about biology and maybe biotech, not high tech. And I think, I guess, we're sort of recognized for being innovative. I guess Forbes has called us one of I've those called you innovative. So. Innovative companies in the world for, for the last couple of years. Um, and the key to innovation. The list I, was broken, though, because you should have been higher. I, I agree. I think you yeah. got it wrong. We should have been number one, not three or four or whatever we were. But the point is that innovation is great. And I am the biggest believer in creating information and gathering information. This is all going to be um, hugely useful. And of course, we're going to be trying to take advantage of all of this. But there's already a lot of information out there. And the key to innovation, I think, is innovating and addressing the real bottlenecks, the real problems, the real things that are holding up healthcare. And while the information age is upon us and will lead to increased breakthroughs and so forth, what people have to recognize is those are not necessarily addressing the most limiting bottlenecks in the healthcare business or in the biotech business. And that's still the biology. But what are those? I mean, are, are patient tracked or patient reported data part of those bottlenecks for you, George? I mean, if there's a. It's definitely not part of the bottleneck. It's part of the potential solution that we can use. But the shops that are going to be the most successful and the ones that are going to deliver the most important drugs to patients are the ones that can provide all the components along the way. So, for example, most of these human information. Um, uh, sources are going to simply lead to hypotheses like PCSK9. It sounds great now, you know, almost 10 years later, but early on there was a lot of people who weren't believers. There was a lot of things that had to be validated and so forth, and that required animal models and genetically humanizing animal models and then testing the animal models. You can't just do this based on some theory that's based just on some gene changes in man. And then you have to develop a therapeutic. That means you have to have technology. So here's, here's my question. I want not just George's a, a, a answer on this, but is that best, does that need to be done in an environment where a lot of the data is locked up? So if you're a company, you know that your investment in this long, the traditional drug model is that, you know, a lot of that discovery process is locked up. Or do we want databases that lots of people can query, that lots of people can access where Lots of people well, have the infrastructure. This is, this is the point that I'm making. I think that this information should be all open and available to everybody because it's not really the limiting step in the process. All the downstream steps are, are, are what's well, really limiting. Well, but you're not giving everybody's Gels uh, their, the, the health records from Gelsinger. You're doing a deal with them to get access to their EMRs to do research there. Well, there's a lot of issues there because these is patient volunteer data that's de-identified but that's held uh, to some constraints because of that. But we are planning, as, as is possible, to make the information widely available at some point. But I'll say just to, you know, to Jamie's point, maybe push back a little bit, I think the technological revolution is transforming the way we practice medicine in the cancer arena. This is clearly playing out where the reagents you have access to that you can give to patients, the molecular information you can now generate at low cost and do it on broad patient basis is transforming how you diagnose and treat the disease. The, obviously, the therapeutic uh, developments are sort of a key challenge, but understanding that information, getting to understanding through better integration of that information and applying it in a clinical arena where you can iterate on it and build these dynamic models where it absolutely has to be open to be able to evolve at the rate we all want to, to best impact the patient. And I think no, you, know, you look at the challenges uh, uh, that get, you know, the dream competitions and Kaggle, you know, the number one thing coming out of those is who's solving the problems to best match small molecules uh, interacting with proteins or any of the myriad of other problems that they solve through this competition-driven, uh, uh, you know, problem solving is uh, the non-experts. It's people that get engaged with that information, you know, the accountant in New Zealand who won the uh, the Boringer uh, Prize uh, for best predicting small molecule protein interactions knew nothing about structural biology and chemistry and so on, but was able to attack the data using algorithms that he was well tuned, not biased by the by the experts, uh, and was able to solve that. That was done through open access to to that information that's directly benefiting uh, those who wanted that problem solved. But let's get to see if there's any questions out there. Anybody want to ask something? No. Can I go to yeah, go question ahead. here? You know, I think that um, there's a, 
there's a, a thing that you said, George, I think is important to touch on. The, the data you're dealing with is based on de-identified patient consented information. And that is a particularly, uh, for me, having been in research for a long time, sort of a problem I see in our system, which is that there is a, uh, a subject-based um, paternalism that suggests that, that is the, actually the only data that the patient doesn't have a legal right to. They have a legal right to their medical record. They have a legal right to their own experience. They do not have a legal right to, to material that they've actually asked to participate in in a research experiment. And I, I think that we what, need What do you mean by that? I mean that they, they, that, that, that they have a legal right to all the access to their, their, to their health record, but if they don't have a legal right to the genomics that you've done on that, unless no, it's no, part do. of the health record. So, the so, no, so they have act, so for example, if they have checked the right box, then their genomic information can be made available to them. Uh, cool, and I'm glad you did that. Okay. So, the, but the point that I think is important here to think about this shift is, you know, we have 300,000 people that have on a named, consented, ongoing participation basis being willing to participate in any research process. So there's, not, there's evidence that you can do this at massive scale in full partnership. And I think this is what has to change. This is the difference between sort of the closed model to where the patients are actually involved and directed. And they are, they're up for the reuse of their data in any context. They're up for the reuse of their data. It's like, you know, with certain rights that are protected as part of the contract that we have between them as a company. And I think the implication of that, this is, there's a couple things that are really important that are not being touched on here. The, you are right that the, the model that I'm describing for how things can be are not affecting the way it is now. But the, the difference is, is that what we do now is we establish evidence that something is worthwhile in a certain circumstance, and then we deploy that in a system that at best checks that it followed the evidence, but never actually learns whether the evidence is correct in the real world. And, you know, and this is really important. Healthcare does not measure. Sometimes it measures whether it does what it thinks it should do, but it never measures whether what it did did any good in the patient context of helping someone. That's what discovery and development are about. Except it, for mortality. Except, well, even there, we don't even really do it. I mean, you know, as well okay. as we should. Right. So, so and, you know, death is easier to measure than most things. Um, so I think that we have to imagine a system that shifts from being we establish evidence and then practice it to something that recognizes that all evidence is continuous. And it is always learning about whether the evidence is more or less accurate by you know, running predictive algorithms in the real world, measuring outcomes in the real world in healthcare. And, and in order for the ecosystem to emerge. But the system, I'm, I'm totally confused is what you're saying. I mean, we're constantly doing post-approval registry studies in the real world to see that our drug that gives back vision in clinical trials does it but in the that, real but world. But that's in the context of a specific drug. In the context of does the heart disease treatment that someone receives at Gelsinger make an impact on whether the patient did well in their life, was able to accomplish their own goals, we don't measure that. Your drug might be measured in a, in a specific context broadly, but the system itself is an integrated holistic effect on what the, happens to the individual, doesn't measure its outcome. So a learning system has to track well, when, when you do clinical trials, you definitely measure and the FDA demands that you look at things like quality of life and so forth. So of course you're showing that you're improving their quality of life. So I don't, I don't know what you're getting at. That's different. I think he's talking about having more variables at once. It's almost the opposite of a clinical trial. Yeah, so. this, is right. the, this, is, this is that we should be running an observational study on everyone in the United States that consents to it. And our evidence suggests that 90% of the people consent to it. And so you just to ask people. An observational how, study in a non-controlled manner? I'm not, this is in terms of understanding. I mean, this all sounds great, but you heard yesterday, you know, I, I thought, you know, very eloquently from Ed Cox that we all know that as soon as people think that they're on a treatment that might be helping it, it influences the way they feel about it. So unless you do it in the most rigorous way, you don't get any useful data or evidence. So the best data that you can get is well-controlled uh, data that, that you can obtain in, in a manner that's perfectly designed. I mean, Otherwise, I think, I, 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 th I, th I think it needs to, it definitely needs to be on the learning track. I think the randomized control trials, they are robust from the standpoint of inferring causality, but it's, it's too, way too limiting. Like we're not gonna achieve the benefit from all the information and the drug assets that exist or, in, or behavior modifications without turning that upside down and saying we need to have a, a, you know, the patient population, the consumers as a clinical trial population and that all needs to be adaptive. It's real time learning that as things are being taken, as outcomes are being measured, 
those algorithms are being shifted on the fly to determine who's benefiting, who's not benefiting. You're simply not going to achieve that kind of benefit through randomized controlled trials. You will limit. We can be very, we'd be very specific. Well, Linda. What, yes, well, what are the data that you're missing when you have such a controlled experiment? Like, you know, what if people, if one person on a drug or a bunch of people on a drug are having headaches and you think, oh, is that associated with the drug? But it turns out if they had a, the Y things bathroom scale and they saw their CO2 levels in their bedroom every night and that's what it's attributed to, it has nothing to do with the drug. We don't see any of that data in clinical trials right now. And I totally agree with Eric that we need to open this up allow for more data and allow consumers to you know, have but the, more. The problem that you yeah. have there, I mean, obviously you haven't done too much, you know, statistical analysis of trials, but what you're talking about suffers from problems of multiplicity. And when you have multiplicity, when you're studying so many variables, you're, it's impossible to really control for them in a, in a really fundamental way. So you get a lot of, once again, hypotheses that you know, need to be tested. But I think we're getting away from the... From that's, the that's, that's not true. I, I mean, the that's untrue. You look at the cancer... The, I want to hear Eric's answer first. The, the cancer studies today that are being carried out in a clinical setting where the outcomes of that genomic information and applied to those patients, those outcomes are being assessed and measured, not in a formal uh, necessary clinical trial like a pharma company would run, but they're absolutely impacting care. Those papers are being published. They're appearing on panels. They're being run on people. The healthcare system's adapting to that, so that's just a proof. Well, uh, no, here, the, give me give me one example so, so, of well, a really a, a big benefit that you're talking about that came from this. Well, let's, approach. let's talk about a problem for a second. No, no, I, I, no, no. I think the benefit question is fair. Let's, okay, so so um, so you can talk about all sorts of papers that are published and people starting companies and making money, but give me an example of of of, of, of a real benefit that it gave somebody. So there are not the story that we heard. The beautiful story that we heard this morning didn't come from that sort of an approach. All right. So so panels such as Foundation Medicine, we treat a large number of patients where those panels are being well, run. Well, we actually could argue about this because that story we heard this morning was a ROS1 mutation, which is a mutation that isn't even, certainly didn't come from clinical trials either. I mean, no one's, the, the trials on ROS1 are small. It's just the effect size is so big. Well, but that's what you're talking about. You're talking about evidence where an effect size is big. This is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about yes. here gathering data from hundreds of millions no, of people based on very small effects to try to learn something. What you're talking about is, yes, if you have a 100% clinical effect, then you only need a clinical trial of one. That's like the most famous sort of tenet. It's all the balance of effect size. So it is exactly what I'm talking about. Evidence is based on how strong the effect is compared to how you study it. When you study these very you know, wishy-washy type of things, unless you're perfectly controlling it, all you get so, is So what is about the framing heart study or the nurses study? I mean, you're saying that the, the data that's come out of these evidence models that have been, been taught us about the relationship of cholesterol and heart disease, which was the start of your journey, did, was that not a useful study? But the, the study that showed that people on statins versus people not on statins? No, he's framing him. The, he's the, going the, back the to showing that HDL and cholesterol, cholesterol are an epidemiological. Disease. It came right. out of an epidemiological study like the one that we're yeah, running so, in a virtual context. So well, I, are you arguing that that's not useful information? No, but in that particular case, what I'm arguing is there you're using very hard data. You're using a number that you can measure for people that's also not influenced by how they feel and so forth. So, so that's a very, very different uh, type of... Cholesterol, uh, cholesterol is absolutely so, so, influenced so, by so, how you feel, so, so by the, the way. Actually, Say let's it be, louder, let's, Linda. Let's be very specific. Cholesterol is not influenced the by back how you feel. Yeah. So oh, completely the, the back depression true. scale created an entire market for the anti antidepressant drugs. It created a class, a whole class of drugs. This is an invention that a psychiatrist wrote in a weekend about what he thought depression was. It was never validated, it was never debated. And it's how people feel. And it created an entire market of you know, probably a hundred billion in sales of, of drugs that actually had a, a significant impact in human condition. Well, so I didn't, say, I didn't say that you can't do hypo, I'm saying it's hypothesis generating, that's this, what this, I said. This. Things are hypothesis generating, but most things that are hypothesis generating, 99% of things that are hypothesis generating fail. So of course, you can give me an example of a hypothesis that's generated from soft data that succeeds, but you're ignoring the 999 other ones that failed from a soft hypothesis. So, so can Linda, I outline this problem? This, well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would push back on that strongly um, because I feel like N of 1, I, I'm sure you would probably feel that N of 1 data means nothing. It's N of No, I, I just... feels N of 1 data means a lot when the effect size is big and nothing when the effect size is small. But even if it's small. a small effect size, what if a person... So, and, and I'm, I, you know, it's funny that we're separated this far because I'm, I'm, on, I'm on Peter's side of this. Peter Bach made the comment about people who are pre-diagnosed who 
don't have a condition yet. That's, that's where I think we need to have much more focus. So we started out with Research 1.0, as we kind of defined it when we were starting 23andMe, was it was, you know, single disorder, single gene disorders. It's a really clear phenotype. That was the low-hanging fruit. You go after that. Research 2.0 was more, you know, it's, we're going to go after heart disease and some of these others. Now we're in this world of chronic fatigue syndrome and my fibromyalgia where the labels don't even really fit. So the diagnosis is this wishy-washy thing. That's where we're going to need way more consumer data. And so that's, that's kind of, you know, just to kind of make that point that that's, that's where we're focusing because that's, that's the only way. No doctor, no clinical trial is going to gather the kind of data that we can actually come up with new labels for some of these conditions that are more defined around microbiome and, you know, we start to bring in tons of more data that will start to inform what's actually going on with the patient. And that will get us more to this notion of personalized medicine. And that's another thing we haven't talked about, but just still drugs are being developed that only work in what, 40 40% of the people who take them. That's a really good That's one. That's a label, yeah, it's a label problem, I think. Well, no, we but once again, my disease. only point is, I don't disagree with any of this. This is all right. great stuff. Right. But my only point was, once again, in the health, healthcare business, these are all great sort of background data to be generating, to yeah, be absolutely. leading to hypothesis and so forth. I have no problem with that. Those are not, though, the things that are required in the near term to take existing. There's a, still a lot of what you refer to as 1.0 and 2.0, you know, we have, you know, six or seven drugs in our pipeline that are just like PCSK9 that look like they're helping almost 100% of the people who actually take them. Awesome. Um, and they, they're basically all based on these genetics 1.0 and 2.0, and that's not the limiting factor right now to coming up with new advances and new potential drugs that can help people. So this is great to generate new hypotheses and so forth, but Healthcare is much different than high tech and so forth, where the solutions are not going to come from these things. These are going to just be the upfront, um, wishy washy, as you put them, hypotheses, which then have to go through the critical bottlenecks and steps to be turned into useful solutions that can make differences in people's lives. And all I'll say so is that. So I want to take one quick it, question. Do we have someone other than Paul? Oh. Peter has a question. Well, okay, Peter. It's, uh, you were first one last time. I would rather so neither of you guys. It, but. It's, it's two quick questions for the panel, or they're related. One is, or I'll just tell you my impression, which is that the, the construct or the division between hypothesis testing and hypothesis generation, I would argue today is shifting. There are, the areas are blurred. And I guess I'm looking, I've got three nodding heads, so I guess three or four, that's good for a cancer trial. Um, the, the, but the question is, you know, in this Bayesian world with adaptive designs, is that, and learning post-trial, is, is that notion that we can only learn things inferentially at first, then they have to be rigorously tested, is that being challenged? The other is this issue of the ownership of clinical trials data by patients. How would people on the panel feel about, fine, it's the property of pharma, even though it's donated by the patients, but then it can be fully reused? by patients at their consent and given back to them when the trial is done. Is that a way forward here? Because this is, I see this as a fundamental challenge about the ownership of those data right now. Yeah, I will just say that I think the adaptive uh, trial design, the adaptive learning is absolutely challenging the old guard. And we're not operating just in high tech. I work in a healthcare system. We are treating patients and we can today stratify patient populations based on the very high dimensional data that exists in their EMR, other outside of the EMR that gets generated on them, stratify them in an a patients like me kind of way, say how did that person group in this, in, in this particular group, how were they being treated, those patients who benefited from a given drug or not, and making real time decisions on how to treat a given patient based on that without having the trial a priori, but doing it in real time and adapting as we learn because how a patient would get treated otherwise with standard of care is more or less random given options within the standard of care arena. And if we can bring that have evidence you, have to you actually bear, proved that this it makes any difference in healthcare outcomes? Yeah, I mean, so these studies are like going. So yeah, it hasn't uh, been going long enough. It took you 10 years after somebody else identified the PCSK9 to, to get to the drug. These things take time. You've got to accumulate the evidence. Uh, so I think that's yeah, what's when happening. You're I, using it, that implies that you're using it and you know it works. You're using it and you don't know it works. I just wanted to make that point. 
Right, we're yeah, trying to change the... But George, uh, George we, we, you know, you're living in a, in a fictional world where medicine is practiced according to guidelines, and the reality is that, yes, at the evidence model, what you have to do is to produce a result that meets a, a, the highest level of evidence standard in the world, which is passing through the FDA that makes a difference. But hold on, but hold on. No, no, but, but, you know, the, the joke about this is, is you guys were the ones who were just citing the fact that people, you know, we're, we're treating breast cancer patients in, an, uh, in a way that was not there was no guidelines because th there was no data out there. And so doctors were just doing what they thought. And then many years later, we find out that doctors who are treating people based on their whims or what they think or, or how they feel don't come up with the best but the question types is, of treatment. So you're right. The real world does not deliver the best health care. And many times what we find out is when doctors are left to their own whims, they deliver the worst kind of health care. And Geisinger, for example, is a leader in having shown this because they developed, the reason they developed their electronic health records and so forth is all their doctors were practicing medicine differently based on their own inferential approaches and so forth. And they found out that, well, well, this was leading to all sorts of random outcomes. And they tried to standardize it and do all sorts of controls methods to find out, well, which is the best way to actually treat a meniscal tear? Oh, and it turns out surgery that 99% of people so, have so does, isn't so, that worthwhile. So, so here's a question. Or people here, being treated for breast cancer with surgery and chemotherapy when they don't need Go it. Ahead. Well, that's a waste. Here's a question that it would be nice if Gessinger could answer. How well can the people that they gave hip replacements to walk before they got the hip replacement, how well can they walk three, six, nine, and five years later? And three, six, nine months and five years later. And the answer is they don't know whether those people are alive five years later right now. So to imply that not measuring that would add value to the system, I mean, this is, to me, this is basic. This is, you know, you have, uh, you have 27 epilepsy drugs on market right now against six mechanisms, against a, a completely heterogeneous disease, both at the phenotypic and, 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 and pathology level and in the cause level. Right, but measuring the absence, problem, but measuring the absence of a useful measure is meaningless. So if I told you 60% of the people at five years were walking really well, well, that would be interesting. Should they have had hip replacement surgery? What? Yeah, actually, the question is... No, see, it. wrong, guys. Because what if I told you that 80% of the people who didn't have hip replacement surgery were walking well? This is the problem. Well, well, that's what this is what measure. you folks don't understand. It's the fundamental basis of rigorous testing, which you just fell into the trap because you, it shows. It's not... Oh, 60% of people are walking really well after hip replacement surgeries. How would they have done if you had done a different treatment? That's what it's all about. They do That's why you can't just get random data. It's all got to be compared to something in a rigorous, blinded way. Otherwise, you fall into exactly that trap. So Sorry, you don't put everybody on a hip replacement hopefully we've confused based on, 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 on one-arm studies. Hopefully, we of this argument, right. which is what I wanted to do here. I'm going to quickly... Science has already, has already answered. It's like quickly. global warming. Science has answered this argument. It's the people who are not scientists who are still arguing. The, the, I'm going to quickly just show something that's sobering, which is our poll result. Uh, can we get up the consumer survey? It may have gone up earlier, but so people are actually sort of okay with giving their data for medical research, but they really want it for their own benefit. And do we have the survey from in the room? You guys, on the other hand, really don't want to give your data to medical research. So um, everybody vote in the polls. Thank you very much, guys. This was, this was great. <laughs> Um, thank you for, for being here.